I'm going to do something very unusual for a morning meeting. I'm going to ask our brother Robert if he'll come at this time and minister to us in the gospel and song. Now, I believe that the Spirit of God has laid this upon my heart to ask Robert uh, that our hearts may be prepared for the message of the Lord. And so, Robert, maybe you would come at this time and sing to us. Thank you very much indeed. When my soul was disturbed with sorrow, when my heart was burdened with sin, Jesus opened his arms of mercy and tenderly took me in. There was peace in the time of trouble. There was peace in the midst of the storm. There was peace though the world be raging in the shelter of his arms. There are storms that we all encounter. Do not fear, they will do you no harm. In the Lord you will find protection in the shelter of his arms. There is peace in the time of trouble. There is peace in the midst of the storm. There is peace though the world be raging in the shelter of his own. Though the world all around be raging and is filled with many alarms, trust in Jesus and he will keep you in the shelter of his arms. There was peace in the time of trouble. There was peace in the midst of the storm. There was peace though the world be in the shelter of his arms. There is peace though the world be raging in the shelter of his arms. Thank you. 
Joan very, very much indeed. I really appreciate that. It's lovely to see you this morning. We're turning to Genesis chapter 8, please. Genesis chapter 8. A portion of scripture we're reading this morning that will be familiar to Paul and Doreen. Because I'll be reading something that I read at their wedding, and it's uh, extraordinary that they're back this morning. But we're going to read, first of all, from Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, please. <clears throat> and Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing, as I have done, while the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Now keep your Bible open there for a moment. I want to explain to you that Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives have now come forth at this time out of the ark after the flood waters have subsided. And as soon as his foot touches the ground, the first thought that is in Noah's head is to worship the Lord God who has saved him by his grace. And he built an altar unto the Lord. And he offered burnt offerings upon that altar. You see, sin was acknowledged. Sin was confessed. The sin question must always be settled as we come to worship the Lord. And the sacrificially shed blood was freely flowing in that place of sacrifice that day. And we're told in our reading that God was well pleased with the sweet-smelling savor that arose from the place of sacrifice. And so God our Father responds by giving to Noah an unconditional covenant in grace covenant is a pact, an agreement between two people. It's a guarantee, not only to Noah and his family, but to every living thing, a guarantee of the regular order of seed time and harvest and winter and summer and day and night and heat and cold. And God promises that never again shall the whole earth be destroyed with a flood. God promises that. And then we break into verse 11 of chapter 9. God is speaking to Noah and his sons here. And he says, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant 
which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. May God add his blessing to the reading of his own precious, infallible word to all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if your mind is anything like mine, and especially this morning, then it takes a little while to register the truths that are being portrayed to it. And so I want to begin this morning by asking some questions, which I believe will help us to understand the passage before us. First of all, what was the purpose for which God made the rainbow? What was the purpose? I remind you that nobody had ever even seen a rainbow with all its beautiful colors shining brightly and dazzling in the sky until after the flood. Did you know that? There never had been a rainbow before the flood. You remember on the second day of creation, God divided the waters above from the waters beneath. Now, not the clouds above from the waters beneath, as we sometimes read into it with our own preconceived ideas, but God separated with a great expanse of firmament, which we call the atmospheric heavens. God separated the waters above from the waters beneath. And the word of God tells us that rain was something not seen as yet. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. You see, there was a great canopy of water all around the earth, like a skin around an orange. It maybe was in a vapor-like form, we don't know. But it encircled at, and it enveloped the whole earth just like the ozone layer used to do, only it was water, not ozone. And this water canopy insulated the earth with a worldwide tropical climate right up until the days of the flood, whenever it collapsed. And God's word says in Genesis 7, verse 11, the windows of heaven were open. And so obviously, a vast overhead reservoir is being released as well as the rain itself and the subterranean fountains of the deep began to burst and swell and rise as well. And then whenever that water canopy was removed, the North Poles and the South Pole, where there's no sunshine for six months out of every year, were suddenly frozen by the extreme cold rushing in from outer space into the atmosphere. This would account for five million Fast frozen mammoths, big things like elephants, hairy elephants, five million of them suddenly frozen in blocks of ice in northern Siberia and Alaska and the Arctic with buttercups and lush vegetation still in their mouths and stomachs. They had been suddenly frozen where they stood. And this explains the coral reefs that are fossilized and the coal seams at the poles. You can't have coal seams unless you had lush vegetation. And there are coal seams at the poles. Now this had a devastating effect upon man's lifespan. Because the harmful rays of cosmic radiation knew no barrier now. And our lifespan was reduced to a tenth of what it formerly had been. Men used to live to nearly a thousand years old. Now suddenly, a hundred was a very old age. This, of course, is the explanation of why there was no rainbow before the flood, because there was no rain until afterwards, and you can't have a rainbow without rain. And the purpose for which God gave us the lovely rainbow in the clouds is stated in verse 12 of chapter 9 of Genesis. God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. This is the token of the covenant. This, God says, is a vivid reminder of my pledge to you. God sealed his promise with this sign in the sky. He says, when you see this token, you'll remember my promise. 
It's a visible token of the pact or covenant that God made not only with Noah and with all mankind after him, but with the lowliest bird and worm and reptile and every living creature. Now, that's the purpose of the rainbow. But what is the promise then attached to that token of the rainbow? What was the promise that God sealed with this sign? Well, God gave Noah not only the promise of seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night, but that he would never destroy mankind with a worldwide deluge ever again. Nor would he ever destroy the earth with a flood ever again. Now this gives the lie to those who say that the Genesis flood was only a local thing. It was something that happened out in the Middle East. didn't affect anywhere else. There have been many great local floods ever since this, but God's not a liar. God said there would never be a worldwide flood like this one again. And the Genesis flood, my friend, was a worldwide event. Look at Genesis chapter 6 for a moment with me. Verse 17. God is speaking here. And he says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. All flesh, wherein is the breath of life under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Look at chapter 7, verse 18. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. It's no local thing. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. At least twenty-two and a half feet above the highest mountains, those waters prevailed. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and cattle, beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, and all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. God couldn't make it clear, you know. Look at chapter 8 and verse 3. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, exactly the same day that our Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead on exactly the same month. The ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Now that's 16,254 foot high. 16,254 foot high. Some flood, eh? Some flood. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Oh friend, this is a worldwide event. You're not telling me the waters went up in a heap and covered Mount Ararat on its own. Oh, no. We can see the very mountains were covered. This is no local flood. This is a worldwide catastrophe. Now, we see the purpose, and we see the promise. But what was the period of time for which this promise would be followed? God said at the end of verse 12, for perpetual generations. It's for all time, this promise. Now, what was the practice that God promised personally to perform each and every time that the rainbow appears, no matter where it appears. Verse 14 of uh, Genesis chapter 9 says, And it shall come to pass, God is speaking here, And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud. Notice who's bringing the cloud. When I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember. Notice who's remembering. My covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it. God says, I look upon it, that I may remember, God wants to remember, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature 
of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, I just want to mark here that it's God himself who brings the cloud. And it's God himself who put the rainbow in it. And it's God himself who promises to look upon it. And it's God himself who vows to remember his oath. Just want you to see that. It's all of God's grace. Now, we've seen the purpose and the promise and the period and the practice. But what is the pertinence or the pertinency, if you like? What is the relevance of all this to you and I as we sit here this morning as believers, spiritually speaking? What's the relevance to this? thing? Well, as we gaze in wonder, my friend, and delight at the meaning of God's rainbows, it ought to flood our minds and our hearts as believers with an awareness of the faithfulness of God's promises. The faithfulness of God's promises. So I would ask you now, to relax. And I would ask you to really allow God's word to your heart this morning to speak peace and assurance to your soul. Because whenever we have a sight of God's rainbow, we have an awareness of the faithfulness of God's promises. Just think what that meant to Noah for a moment. There were only eight people left on the earth to be able to see that very first rainbow. Noah and his wife and his three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their three wives. Eight people. That's all that were left on the earth to see the first rainbow. Now just visualize for a moment the horrendous worldwide devastation that the great deluge had caused. Bodies everywhere. Animals, humans, everything. All lying dead, silent. Just think of it for a moment. Think of the destruction and the depopulation of corrupt mankind and his works upon the face of the whole earth. Are we not reminded as we think of this that God's word states it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? Do you know what's wrong in our land? I do you know what's wrong with our planet today? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Homosexuals can sit openly on your TV screens with no shame, with no thought of God. Men can stand with white collars on saying, yes, I'm one too. And it doesn't occur to them that God struck Sodom and Gomorrah for that very sin. Oh, friend, I better not get warmed up this morning. But I tell you this, that men and women ought to fear God, no matter what their sin is, because all sin is sin in the nostrils of God. Your sin will damn you if you're not saved this morning, no matter what that sin might be. We ought to fear God, lest we should incur his judgment and his wrath this is the God who loves you, yes. This is the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But he's also a righteous God, a holy God. He's a God of wrath. And he says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now Noah and his family have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you see where they found the grace? It was in the eyes of the Lord. And remember that they were saved from God's judgment and wrath because Noah was moved with fear. He just didn't fear. He was moved to do something about it. He was moved with fear. After being warned of God, he prepared an ark to the saving of his whole family, his whole house. And God said when the ark was finished, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And they did. They obeyed. They didn't stand looking at him and saying, I don't know whether I could keep it or not. I haven't really thought about this thing, you know. I haven't just sat down and given enough thought. I don't understand enough about uh, how you walk up that plank and in through that door. I don't really understand it enough. As a matter of fact, I think I want to live my own life and have a good time first. I'll maybe come when I'm thinking of dying, friend. He says, come thou and all thy family into this ark. Come on. And they did. They did. 
They knew what was good for them, friend. And they were saved. Dear unsaved one. And backslider listening to my voice. I want you to be honest now. And by the way, this is God's message, believe you me. I didn't have a clue about anybody coming here this morning who might not be saved. And I don't normally speak to unsaved people on the Lord's Day morning because it's usually a ministry meeting. But I believe that there may well be unsaved people here or maybe backsliders. And God wants to talk to you. This isn't a tailor-made message. I didn't sit in a corner and make this up. You receive it as I got it from the Lord. Has God warned you in some way to prepare to meet thy God? I know he has, and you know he has, if only you were honest. I believe there's someone listening to my voice just now, and you've been well warned. Been well warned. Now I want to ask you, with all the love and compassion that's in my heart, put there, I believe, by the Spirit of God, is it not time that you were moved to do something about it? Is it not time you were moved out of sin's condemnation into Christ's great salvation? Because you can do it where you sit just now. God is concerned about you. Yes, I believe that with all my heart. But God is concerned with your whole family. Somebody here this morning and he wants your whole house in the ark. Come thou and all thy house into the ark. I believe that's God's word to you. You can do what you like with it. You can fling it over your shoulder. You can say he made that up. You can say he saw me in the meeting and he's getting at me. You can say whatever you like. I tell you, it's God's word. It's God's word to you. Now, for us who, like Noah, have found grace already in the eyes of the Lord, I want you to turn with me to the book of the Revelation chapter 4 for a moment, please. Revelation chapter 4. While you're turning to it, I know that the believers here know already that in chapter 2 and chapter 3 we have seven letters being written by John at the command of the risen Lord and sent to seven actual, literal, historical churches in Asia Minor in that day. And when we Christians read about these seven letters, we know that the conditions that existed within those seven churches in that day represent the conditions which would exist in seven historical periods right throughout the church age. And we're living in the last of them, the Laodicean period. But I'm not getting into that. I just want to say in chapter 4 we read after this. And so the church age has run its course. John says, after this I looked. And those that love Christ's appearing ought to be looking in these days. Lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. I want you to see the sight that John saw. A door in heaven. Who's the door? Christ says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And here's Christ coming to the air for his saints. A mystery is about to be revealed as the door's coming out of heaven in the air. Right. And he says, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. I want you to see the sound that John heard. It was a talking trumpet. Sometimes we sing the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And so here's the trumpet sound. And he says, this trumpet said, come up hither. Can you see the shout that John obeyed? Because he came up hither. He had no ladder, lift. He had no helicopter or booster rockets. He's standing on the earth. But he says in verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. The man is suddenly, immediately, in the twinkling of an eye, he's caught up into heaven. There's the sight that John saw. There's the sound that John heard. The saying that John obeyed, the suddenness that John observed. But look at the scene that John surveyed in verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Who is it that's sitting on the throne? It's the King of heaven. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet. 
thy tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like thee his praise shall sing. Oh, we ought to be praising him this morning. He's on the throne. And you can see the centrality of the throne. Now, what sort of a throne is it at this time? Verse 5 shows us it's a throne of judgment. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. So obviously a storm is brewing because the church is now out and the coming storm of God's wrath is about to be unleashed upon this old ungodly world of ours. And in verse 3 we read, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. A jasper is not the jasper that we know today. This is a diamond, clear as crystal, as it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 11. It speaks to us of Christ's sovereign purity. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the sardine stone is a ruby, bloodstone. It's a ruby. And that bloodstone speaks of sacrifice and Christ's splendorous beauty this morning as we have come to remember his death. These are the first and the last stones on the high priest's breastplate. And listen to what it says. There was a rainbow. You didn't expect to find a rainbow there, did you? There was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. The emerald was the stone of Judah on that breastplate of the high priests in Israel. And Judah speaks of praise. And here's this green rainbow speaking of praise all around the throne. Friend, I want to ask you this morning, if judgment is about to be meted out, and we know that it is, who's praising? And why are they praising? I'll tell you. The redeemed of the Lord in heaven, us, friend, we're praising that in wrath he remembers mercy. We're praising that the Lord ever saved the like of us by his grace. Or we never would have been there. We would have been down on the earth just now waiting for those judgments to be meted out. Listen, child of God, the canopy of God's manifold mercies always overspreads all his judgments. There's blessing for the saints of God no matter how his judgments fall on an ungodly world. Did you get that? There's blessing for the saints of God no matter how the judgments fall on this ungodly world. Child of God, remember that when the rainbow appears, the eye of God is upon it. And God says, I will remember my covenant. And what we're looking at here is a full circular rainbow. We can't see the full orb rainbow because the horizon stops it, doesn't it? We only see a semicircular thing. But this is a full circular rainbow around about the throne. And God's eye can never miss it. His eye is always upon it. And he'll always remember his covenant. And he'll always mix it with mercy. And he'll always, always forever, ever more, friend, he'll look down upon his people and say their sins, their iniquities. Will I remember no more? That's his promise. Their sins and their iniquities. He wants to remind your heart today. Yeah, he wants to remind your heart this morning there is therefore now no condemnation, no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus, just as no one his family were in the ark. We're in Christ because we have saving faith in Christ. The rainbow, hallelujah, as God, even in judgment, sits on the throne of judgment. It's all around him. And he has to keep his promise, I said reverently. His eye must always be upon it. And he must always remember his covenant. That thrills my soul. Listen, child of God, you feel the Lord. Who hasn't? Confess that sin. And look to the blood of the everlasting covenant where you sit just now. And let the peace of God flow into your troubled heart. And fill your uneasy conscience with joy and peace. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Jeremiah says in the book of Lamentations, as he turns by faith and looks into the face of God, he says, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. His compassions are new every morning.
every morning. The rainbow around the throne is ever fresh, ever green. It's just hitting me as I talk to you. It's evergreen. Isn't that lovely? I never thought of that. Now, that is only one of the promises of God. But never forget that all God's promises are God's rainbows. Now, you've got to get that. You maybe missed that. Never forget that all God's promises are God's rainbows. You got that now. But the rainbow doesn't just remind us of God's promises, but it also assures us of the certainty of the fulfillment of all God's promises. God will never break his promises. God's promises are unbreakable. And the Bible is the Christian's land of promises, just as Canaan was Israel's land of promise. And we need this morning to go in and possess the land, child of God. The devil will do anything to keep us from the book, to keep us from the promises, because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if we believe the promises, he can't stop us. The rainbow is a beautiful thing to behold, isn't it? It's a token of his all-compassionate love for you. That's what it is, you know. Oh, let it fill your soul. In Jeremiah 31, verse 3, God says, Ah, he says, Yea. He told me this morning, don't leave that yea out. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Isn't that lovely? Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. It's a pledge of his unfailing mercy and forgiveness. Listen, his mercy endureth forever. It endures forever. Diamonds won't endure forever. But God's mercy will endure forever. It's not only a beautiful thing to behold, a token of his all-compassionate love for you, a pledge of his unfailing mercy and forgiveness, friend. It's an assurance of his perfect, unending faithfulness and preservation power on your behalf. God is faithful. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And it's a meaningful message of the completeness because a rainbow's a complete thing. There's so many things I want to go into, I'm not going to go into, but it is a complete thing. And it's a meaningful message of the completeness of the amazing grace of God that saved a wretch like me. Friend, we can only see the half of it down here. But when we get to heaven, we'll see the other side. God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. God's word says, sin shall not have dominion over you. You're in Christ. I was saying to a fellow this week on the phone. He sort of thought he should be sinlessly perfect. I said, you see, even in the ark, there was something that came through from the old antediluvian world, you know as well as Noah and his wife and three sons and their wives. And I'll tell you what it was. It was the flesh. And there was many around the ark. There was jealousy. And I'm sure they were fed up looking at the inside of that ark before they got out. I'm sure there was trouble. Sin revealed its ugly head. But I'll tell you this. It was all covered. Hallelujah. It was all under the pitch. It was all under the blood, child of God. Sin shall not have dominion over you. But we must not see only the faithfulness of God's promises, but also the fellowship with God's person here. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1 for a moment. My Bible, it's 1010, 1009. I know they're all different. In the Old Testament, 1009. So it's halfway through the Bible. You're not far away if you go halfway through the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 26. And Ezekiel is receiving a vision of the throne of God and the one who sat on it. And he says in verse 26, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. The likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. So you can see that he's getting a vision of the throne here and the one who sat on it. Now look at verse 28 for the sake of time. He says, As the appearance of a bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, that's a rainbow, 
So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. That's what that represented. It was the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. That will do us. I just wanted to go and see that the rainbow here can be seen round about the throne by Ezekiel. But he explains to us that it represents the glory of the Lord. That's what it represents. It's a symbol of his glory. And this is the absolute reliability and dependability of the one who made the promises. You see, it's one thing knowing that God will never break his promises and get our faith really fixed on the promises of God. But don't forget the one who made the promises. He'll, not, he'll never let you down, child of God. He'll not break his word. You see, this is the fellowship with God's person I'm talking about. Christ says, have faith in God, even if you haven't got a promise. It's the God of glory is your father. Listen, Paul the apostle couldn't always trace God's hand in, his, in the events and experiences of his life. Sometimes he was perplexed. He couldn't always trace God's hand, but he knew he could always trust God's heart, whether he could trace it or not. And he says, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You can trust him wholly because you know that he's wholly true. He can't fail you, no matter about your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Listen, do you need help today? Do you need consolation? Do you need assurance of God's will? Do you seek guidance from the Lord this morning? The high priest in the tabernacle or in the temple in the Old Testament had a breastplate about his paps with 12 precious stones on it representing the 12 tribes of Israel enveloping all God's people here. And it was folded like a pouch upon his breast. And inside the fold were two stones. They're called the Urim and the Thummim. Translated, that means lights and perfections. And whenever God's counsel was required, they came to the high priest for wisdom, and he used the Urim and Thummim to consult the mind of God for them. He'd put his hand into the pouch, and he'd wait upon God. And guidance was derived as he prayed by whichever stone was chosen and withdrawn by the high priest's hand. Probably one of them meant yes. Maybe a white one. The other one meant no. Maybe a dark one. I don't know. But our Urim and Thummim today is the Old and the New Testament Scriptures, my friend. You have a Urim and Thummim of your own and every child of God is a priest unto God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's what the psalmist taught. And so prayer and fellowship with our great high priest is the hand that withdraws the promise that will light our path this morning and lead us into the perfectness of the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for our own individual lives. Now the rainbow tells us, we have seen this, of the faithfulness of God's promise and the fellowship with God's person. And lastly, the rainbow tells us of the favor of God's presence. The favor of God's presence. Turn to Revelation chapter 10 for a moment, please. Revelation chapter 10. As we conclude our message. Revelation chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 1 very quickly. I don't want to do a Bible study, but I want to get my point over. And I saw another angel. Why does he say another angel? Because you see in chapter 9 and verse 1, you can see that he's talking about a fallen angel. We'll not take time to go into it. But he's talking about a fallen angel there who has the key of the bottomless pit. It's the devil. 
But he says here, I saw another mighty angel. This is no normal angel. And it's not a fallen angel because he's come down from heaven. Indeed, our Lord Jesus Christ taught us as we think of his condescending coming. He says, I came not down from heaven to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And it says that he came down from heaven clothed with a cloud. And the expositors are all agreed that that word a cloud should be the cloud. It's the Shekinah glory. The cloud clothing is the Shekinah, friend. The glory of the Lord. It's the only cloud in heaven. And it says here his face was, as it were, the sun is altogether lovely. And his feet as pillars of fire, reminding us of Calvary as he trod the winepress of the wrath of God alone for us. And then he says here he had in his hand a little book open. He's the worthy one, the only one who was worthy to take the book and open it. And here we can see that he's got this little book in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. Here we can see not only a covenant consciousness here, as we were told in verse 1, and I missed it. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. Did you notice that? You didn't miss it, Jesus. did. And his face was, as it were, the sun, his feet, his pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Here's his challenging claim. This is the two-foot rule of faith. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto thee. He's taking possession of what's rightfully his. This is the Lord of glory coming down to reign for a thousand years. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the king, not of the jungle, the king of Israel. Now you say, George, are you sure it's the Lord? Very quickly, turn down to verse 9. Go down to verse 9 for the sake of time. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And there was given unto me a reed leg unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. Now watch. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. This is Christ told. I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, all I'm wanting you to see here is that it is the Lord, and I want you to see that the Lord of glory has a rainbow on his head. Isn't that what we read together in verse 1? A rainbow was upon his head. A rainbow. The head that once was crowned with thorns, is crowned with glory now. This speaks, my friend, and this is important that you get this. This speaks of the blessing after the storm to every believer's heart. The blessing after the storm. Now, this is my message. Christ is our ark, child of God. He's our Savior. We're saved because we have saving faith in him. And in Noah's day, the sound of the jeering crowd as they mocked him, and the hammer blows on the nails that pierced the ark are just echoes of Calvary because Jesus is our ark. And the crowd mocked him and jeered. And they hammered nails through his hands and feet. And just like the ark creaked and groaned, and was lifted up from the earth when the floodwaters fell. So Jesus, kneeled to the cross, was lifted between heaven and earth, groaning in agony on the cross. In both cases, the work had to be finished. The ark 
had to be finished before God sent the flood. And Christ had to finish the work before he could save us. And listen, as he hung on the cross of Calvary, like that ark, he plunged into the wheels and the billows of God's wrath upon our sins. Just as Christ did hanging on the cross with the crown of thorns upon his blessed bride. Kneels in his hands and feet, his back lashed like a ploughed field in the filthy spittles of the Roman soldiers mingling with his blood on his raw cheek where they pluck the beard and fistfuls. Friend, his visage is marred more than any man. Look away from the meeting. Look away to Calvary for a moment. See the man of sorrows hanging there. And over his head pour the waves and billows of God's wrath. But just like that ark, it went under, and he went under. Sank in the deep mire of our sin where there was no standing. But bless God, like the ark, he arose. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph o'er his foes. And he arose, friend, to give us, like Noah, new life and a new beginning. And there are those here that need Christ. This morning, just now, he wants you to be fruitful and multiply. He wants you to be witnesses unto him. And let me say this to you, believers, I conclude. How precious to know, and God wants you to know, that if a cloud has darkened your sky, if some old cloud has overshadowed your path, and today you don't understand and you can't see where you're going. Remember, it's his bringing. It was God who says, when I bring a cloud. Man, the devil would love you to think it was him. Child of God, he's in sovereign control of everything that affects you. The reins of every eventuality in your life are between his fingers. My times are in thy hand. He knoweth the way that I take. And if he brings the cloud that darkens our path, then you be sure this morning that in some way he's going to reveal his glory in the cloud. Now you be sure of that. Just as sure as he reveals his rainbow in the dark cloud, so he will reveal his glory in that cloud in your life. And our eyes will in turn behold something beautiful. This is the blessing after the storm. This is the blessing after the storm. What though clouds are hovering o'er me, and I seem to walk alone, carrying midst my cares and crosses for the joys that now are flown. If I have Jesus, Jesus only, then my sky will have a gem. Friend, this morning, he's a son of brightest splendor. He's a star of Bethlehem. Child of God, whenever the clouds are hovering over you and you seem to walk alone, and that's where some of you are this morning, when God allows the sun himself to be hidden from view and shadows darken your way and the storm clouds threaten to sink your ship, they cannot. God's going to reveal the rainbow. God will not let the floods descend. It's his promise, I tell you. For the Christian, David Winnings at the back of the hall, he taught me this years ago, the best is always yet to come. The best is always yet to come. For every believer, see if it's not, throw that in the bin. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That's the whole theme of God's word. Weeping shall endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. You know what that means? It means there's always blessing after the storm for the believer. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. That's God's word. I didn't make it up. It's a principle. The days of thy morning shall be ended. Yea, though I walk through the valley, God never takes you into a valley to leave you there. Every valley that God ever took us in, he's brought us through blessing and all was well. Here we have communion with himself. Child of God, is it not amazing grace that saved us this morning? May God grant that we'll never look at a rainbow again without realizing that God has thrown it there. Without realizing that he has discharged all the arrows in his bow to 
There's no RO in the whole universe. It's pointing heavenward. That throne. God has thrown it down because he has discharged those arrows into the wounded, freshly slain lamb who took our place. And yet he's standing in the midst of the throne. And that bow represents God's grace to you and me. And it's amazing grace. No judgment. Blessing. God bless you.